Welcome back to the 411 on Wrestling Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Level. With me once again is uh, 411, Steve Cook. And yes, it is that time uh, of the week again for us to look at uh, the latest episode of the WWE A&E biography and Dark Side of the Ring. We'll start, Steve, as always, with uh, Dark Side of the Ring. And as you and I sort of discussed on the previous episode where we talked about the Ultimate Warrior, um, we knew this this episode of Dark Side of the Ring was going to be not a pleasant one uh, to watch and experience. And I think that is probably uh, what was a pretty safe prediction because that's kind of the biggest takeaway I had just watching this and just... Honestly, at times, just looking at it and um, thinking, my goodness, what what, what an interesting uh, human being, Grizzly Smith. Not exactly a feel-good story. It's uh, one of those things where even when you're sitting here and trying to talk about it, it's like, my God, uh, there's not a lot of positive we can draw from the, from the whole thing of, of Grizzly Smith and the story of his kids who fell into various issues for understandable reasons. And it's somewhat amazing that well, we can't say all the kids are still alive, obviously, and we also can't really say how many other kids Grizzly Smith might have. Right. Just uh, a strange, a strange individual, somebody who, you know, it's weird also because oddly enough, for a long time he was, you know, he was in, in the office for a Mid South. He was, he was a guy that a lot of the wrestlers looked up to, and you didn't really see it. I don't think, think you saw a lot of those people in this particular episode because the people who did look up to Grizzly Smith probably. Most probably wouldn't admit to that after yeah. all the various things came out. You can't really blame those people because it was easier to keep those things a secret back in these day, back in that day. I mean, it's not like now where you know everything's on Twitter and social media, and people can still keep horrible secrets like that. But it's a lot harder now than it was back in the day. Yeah, and I think one of the things we we had kind of wondered was you know what was the what was the cast of characters going to look like in this one? Um, you know, not knowing exactly, you know, who all would they talk to? We, we kind of assume that, you know, you're getting Jake, you, you're thinking that you're probably going to get, you know, the kids. And I think it was just a matter of, okay, well, if you do get, you know, Rock and Robin and Sam Houston and, and, you know, Richard neighbors, I know was the one that, um, you know, was kind of on the outside of that because somehow, I don't, I don't know how. And, and he kind of said it towards the end about, um, you know, his adoption and sort of, that that may have been something that really saved him from a, a lot of this in terms yeah. of um, keeping him away. He was also smart <laughs> enough not to get in the wrestling business. Yes, and, and so he, that, that was a good <laughs> move on his part. He made that very clear. He's like, I wanted no part of the wrestling business, and and as we've seen, I mean, that's something that clearly worked in his advantage um, because he does. He just came across, I thought, as just sort of a, I don't know if you use the word normal, just because you know you know what he kind of went through as well, but it's. Um, you know, not to the extent of the others. And, and that's where I think that, you know, having Jake, having not seen, you know, we, we've we heard of the stuff with Sam Houston and, you know, Michael Smith. And um, of course, you know, Rock and Robin, we can remember back from, from the wrestling part of it. But I think just having all of them, like that was the only way to tell the story. Because if you only had, you know, a couple different ones, you, you can't really fully dive into that but it's like for for to have all of them telling the story from their different perspectives and a lot of it you know sort of connecting to to form that you know thought on what grizzly smith actually was um that was that was a very important part of this because they they all had uh, some, some stories that uh yeah really really sort of um went into the again the the person uh, i think that grizzly smith was so and, you know, we'd, we'd heard a lot of the stories before. I mean, Jake's story's been, you know, it's told a time or two on Beyond the Mats and things like that. And we hear about Sam Houston. We don't, we, you still didn't get all the de- details. Like, especially, like, parts of Rock and Robin's story. I mean, Rock and Robin hasn't been in the public eye as much as Jake Roberts or even yeah. Sam Houston, for that matter. So it was very disturbing to uh, hear some of those stories, uh, you know, things that Grizzly Smith liked to do with, a uh, woman of a particular age that's not that wasn't quite right. Uh, things he did with her, things he did with other young girls, just you know, really unsettling, disturbing, uh, yeah. weird stuff. Yeah, I mean it, it. Like you said, I mean we could. There was just so much in this um, in terms of those particular stories and what was told. I mean, you know, Jake. Simply, I think it sort of started there where, you know, he's like, look, I mean, and I think, like we said, we, we've heard the story before with Jake and all that, but 
you know, Jake's, Jake's, Jake put it as simple as you could. He's like, you know, my mother was 13 when I was born. And um, it's like, yeah, that, that sort of takes it to that level. And then, you know, you have the, the rock and Robin stuff talking about how the, the, you know, the things with her started when she was eight or nine years old. Um, you know, she's recalling some of the incidents I think of uh, where Grizzly Smith had, had visited her that time and had a nine year old girl uh, with him and asking, you know, for Robin to, to make her a daiquiri, a daiquiri and all this other stuff. And I'm just like, my goodness. And, and again, like those are just some of the stories. Like, you know, that unfortunately, had they had, you know, they, they probably had a lot more stories that were in the mix there that probably didn't even make it into this one hour uh, documentary. And, and that's the disturbing part of it is knowing that there were probably more stories of, that the kids don't even know about. Exactly. Right. Like you said, yeah. like, you know, the potential for other kids out there and like all that kind of stuff. Like it's just um, that that's the disturbing part is knowing that what you got here was already disturbing, but also knowing that in the back of your mind, you're thinking, man, these are just the stories being told. Um, there's probably a lot of others. And then of course, um, you know, baby doll, we had, we had mentioned her, we were wondering, you know, obviously with, with her, uh, connection with Sam Houston and all that, was she going to be in there? And then of course, you know, she's also telling the stories of him picking up, you know, girls on road trips and like the, the parents just waving to the girl as they're, as they're leaving. And I'm just like, Oh, this was just like, it's bizarro land. And I'm like, man, this was, this was something that again, when you think about what's told here, what could be out there that was never actually even told to anyone. Um, this is just, it goes into a very, very dark place. Yeah. To wonder what the parents there are thinking too. I mean, oh, I guess yeah. they were thinking that Grizzly Smith was uh, a wrestling hero. I guess, you know, he was one of the top stars in several territories back in the day. And I guess we talk, I, we talk about, I guess the fans back then weren't quite as smart. And I yeah. guess we can mean that a few different ways as well, because <laughs> I guess the, the parents just thought that they you know this is our favorite wrestler here taking our kid off and Lord knows the kid is probably too scared to say anything about it. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, the the aspect of that, like when you and especially back in the day, like you just said, like when you were a when you were a star, like or not I mean not even you know, you have to be a star, but like if you're someone that's just so well known in though in that kind of era especially, you know, in wrestling and knowing just the power that that wields in, in some of those territories, like you said, I mean, it was, it was different. Like it was a different era. And, and you know, a lot of people, you know, like you mentioned, if they're, they're not smartened up, um, it's, it's a very different kind of look and how you look at these people. And um, I think that's something, you know, where they were talking about, you know, with Sam Houston and, and you know, talking about the, the DUIs and all that. And, setting the the Texas record and everything. And, and there's another one where I think it was, um, I can't remember who said it, but talking about, or Cornette, I think Cornette was the one that said, you know, he'd only been caught 20 times. You know, there's no telling how many other times mm-hmm. you're out there. And um, that, that kind of parallels into what we just said with Grizzly Smith. But it's like, they were talking about how, you know, Grizzly Smith using his power to, to keep Sam Houston, you know, out of trouble and all this. And, and that's what, like you had just said, I mean, <sighs> It's just it's so hard to fathom kind of looking at back now in hindsight. And, and obviously that's the benefit we have. But it's just th- there were so many different things from this. And, and it is one where it's like I'm sitting watching some of this and I'm just like it's making me sick to my stomach. Like just thinking about like some of this stuff and some of these stories. And um, I think one of the things in particular Jake's talking about and they all sort of kind of hit on this theme, but just playing sort of those manipulative, you know, psychological games like even on the kids like at an early age and we know like this was the era of of kayfabe and all this other stuff and you know wrestling was real and and there was not going to be any you know doubt otherwise and you were always going to play that up but it's like you know jake's recalling like him just really talking about how you know his next match is going to be life or death and the kids are just scared to death and it's just like man what a like it was and and, and like rock, rock and robin said it like basically she used the word and and like I don't know how else you come out of this, not just kind of tying that word to him, but like she basically said, you know, like he was my monster. And like, that's how he certainly comes across when you read the stuff from the past and you really watch this, this hour worth of um, documentary on him. Like that's, that's the, that's the formation you get from all of this. It helps explain a lot about the kids too. Let's be honest. I mean, you, you don't really wonder why Sam Houston set the record for DUIs in yeah, state of Texas. True. You don't really wonder why Jake Snake Roberts wound up the way he wound up, and you're kind of absolutely amazed that Jake Snake Roberts is still alive today, quite frankly, with some of the stuff he's been through, some of the things he's done. 
something's been done to him. And uh, you know, Rock and Robin as well, if not as publicized as the other two, but uh, definitely had her own, you know, her own things to deal with. And yeah, and there's, and it's tough to say to just don't jump on. Like how many, how many people did Grizzly affect like that? Like how many young girls or whatever? How many, like how many were there? Well, and let's face it too. Like the one there, there is one part of the story that you know is still. Uh, clearly when you you hear them all recall that part of it but um you know i think rock and robin's words were 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 the most um i don't know significance the word but it's just like you know she's basically recalling the case of of joe lynn which was you know they're also part of the family and um you had the i guess it was the chief of police uh texas sort of recalling the case and the kidnapping and all those other things um, but I mean, you basically got Robin coming out like, Hey, I know I basically you're just saying, Hey, I, I'm curious. Like, did, did he do this? Like, you know, did she know too much? Like, did she know everything that the Grizzly Smith had been doing? And, and, you know, maybe that's just like, that was a, again, that's a very dark path and a dark road you go down, uh, as part of this, but like, that just adds another, you know, part of the story where it's just like, my goodness, um, you know, you, you can let your imagination run wild on this kind of stuff, but it's, you know, that there, there's so many, like, it's not just that part about the young girls and everything, but it's like, you have members of the family wondering, like, was this something where, you know, their, you know, sibling, like, it's just, I don't know, like, that was something where I, that was one where I think we, we had heard about, like, obviously, if you, you've heard about that before with the different stories and such, which you can find out there, um, you know, recapping kind of that, that case and everything, but it's, like, to actually see it presented this way, and then to have, you know, sort of the reaction from the kids uh, on wondering, you know, what actually happened here, and, and they went into it a little bit, but it's like, my goodness, like that's just another layer onto this very, very complicated story of a very, very complicated family. Yeah, Jake had told that story before on his uh, DVD with the WD from back in the day, yeah. and he had not made that. He had not made that connection. Like he, he, he talked about how you know it was the, uh, I guess the the curious was the uh, the ex wife of her current husband, right. if I remember correctly. It's you know these. He said, it's tough to keep, you need a scorecard for a lot of these relationships yes. here, quite frankly. But uh, he had not made the connection that uh, maybe Grizzly was involved in that somehow. And it's not that hard to come to that conclusion either, because Grizzly, uh, he, he was involved in a lot of different things with a lot of different people. And a lot of people that were related to each other as well. Uh, Grizzly did not, uh, he was not against uh, having certain relationships in, in the same family. Let's just put to put it that way. Yeah, that um that was certainly brought up uh multiple times, I think, in this. And um yeah, it's just it is amazing to think about. Um, you know, and, and again, we don't know all the details of we, we know a lot of the details of Jake's story and all that, but like we don't know all the details of, of the full story, you know, on You'll on never Jake. know all of them. They right. all died with uh, they all died at Grizzly Smith pretty yeah. much. I mean that's that's the thing. And and I think, you know, that that sort of goes into sort of just the overall impact I think that it's had. And and to think, you know, Jake's talked about it a lot. Uh, As you said, we, we haven't really heard a lot from Robin, Sam Houston stuff. We've, we've heard about him, but you know, in in the wrong manner in terms of, like you said, the the arrests and that kind of stuff. But um, it it is wild just to, to think about the overall impact. And I think one of the things, and Jake may have said this, you know, at some point before, but I, I thought that the line he had, about basically saying, you know, that Aurelian, which is his real name, um, you know, hasn't basically hasn't advanced beyond, you know, whatever he said, I think it was the age of 12 or 13 or something like that. And basically saying, you know, that, that kid, like, I don't even know if he didn't say died, but sort of that, that kid stopped there, like as a teenager, based on everything that he had experienced. And then from there on, you know, he's been Jake Roberts. And um, that's just like, like, you just think about that, like, that is a total it just just completely twists your mind. Like it's just like to to think about sort of the way he said that and that line. It's just like that is such a complicated mess to think about. Like that guy, that's how he looks at it. Like he believes that 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 kid that he was like never was able to sort of advance beyond just those teenage years, and then that's when he became Jake the Snake. And as we know, there have been plenty of twists and turns for him 
since that point. But it's just like, like that as to the psychological aspect of all this, where it's just like, how is this guy still here? Like, how is this guy still? And we, we said it on the last episode, but it's like DDP. Like that's, I mean, that there's no other way to, but still like even the DDP stuff, like, I don't know how, how did Jake even make it to that point to even be in that position, you know, to, to do that. And as we saw, I mean, they showed the stuff from the heroes of wrestling pay-per-view and all those other things. Like it's just, uh, every time I see stuff like this, anything on Jake, that's the first thing I think of is how in the world is this guy still here based on everything he's gone through? And then when you get the full story, and like we said, it's not even really the full story, but when you just get, you know, the deeper dive into his childhood and everything, it even adds even more to that. It's like, how in the hell is this guy still doing what he does? Well, that's the thing is pro wrestling kind of attracts these kind of people who, yeah, Jake talked about how Aurelian pretty much, uh, stopped evolving at 12 or 13 and he became jake the snake roberts and wrestling kind of encourages people to uh be a different character because yeah. in wrestling you're always trying to work people you're always trying to you know tell the story that you want to tell and that's why you know that's why jake and sam houston and rock and robin probably all got into wrestling business even though Seems like a terrible idea for somebody. I mean, I, I I always think when I hear stories like this, then there are kids that I'm getting wrestling too. Like with a uh, heck with Brian Pillman, like a you know not yeah. as serious a situation, but still you wonder like why does kids get in the wrestling business? It just doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense on the surface. But then you kind of realize that wrestling is a place where you can go to uh, get away from things and uh, create a whole new persona and a whole new life for yourself and. That's what all these kids tried to do, and they didn't have a whole lot of success at creating a whole new life for themselves, that's for sure. I mean, Jake definitely had his success in the business, and Sam Houston had a, had a time or two where he's doing big things, and Rock and Robin is a champion, but they never they never got out of the uh, shadow of Grizzly Smith in more ways than one. Yeah, there's no one. There's no way to do it. Like, it's just, yeah, you're, you're not going to be able to advance beyond something like that, and that's a good point about like drawing the the parallels, um, you know, with the Brian Pillman, uh, even like, you know, to, to a certain extent, like the ultimate warrior, we talked about that sort of like we mentioned his childhood and obviously completely different circumstance, but it's like, he became that character out of, you know, almost like it felt like necessity to him to, to sort of, you know, unfortunately lean too far into that character. And as we said, I mean, that's been a common theme with some of the people that have been profiled throughout Dark Side of the Ring, I mean, specifically this season. I mean, we have several examples there uh, just looking at that. But, um, yeah, there nothing like this, though. Um, and I think that's just, like, this made... I think this was probably one of the... Like, like this was one of the hardest to watch just because, obviously, there is no different... I mean, there's no story like this when you... You know, you can go up and down the line. Like, there is just... There's nothing like this that probably we've seen from a, a wrestling standpoint. I mean, sure, are there other situations out there... Um, that could be absolutely, we may just not know about it. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, Jake kind of said was basically there's a, there, there's so much stuff like this happening out there now. And I think it's, you know, uh, you know, Jake's story and the story of this entire family is going to get featured because, um, you know, these are, these are people who have been in the public eye before they, they've been, you know, figures in a, a very large company and that kind of stuff. But unfortunately, you know, not everyone has that luxury. And, and I think that's where, it's hard to watch this particular episode, but at the same time, I mean, you have to assume that uh, hopefully if there is, you know, anyone out there that, that is kind of going through a situation, um, hopefully not to this extent, but like if there are any of these sort of common um, themes in there, uh, you know, whether it's growing up as a child, having to experience stuff like this, um, at least maybe, you know, there is something out of this where, you know, you're able to, and that was the closing line of, of the documentary of this episode was, you know, basically Jake just, you know, telling anyone to to run and, and to get help and do all this other stuff. So, I mean, I feel like, you know, for Jake, it's obviously, as we said, it's been quite a roller coaster. Um, now, though, when you look at him and you kind of see how far he's come, you would have to think that, hey, at least maybe for Jake, there there is something good that's come out of this. I mean, he's obviously revamped himself and, and tried, you know, he's he's been a regular figure on AEW, but now to maybe just have that opportunity to, to help someone else that is in a situation like this, that, that all of, you know, he's been in, his family's been in. Um, I don't know. I know it's, it's never going to, you know, completely replace that feeling that he felt of, of how it was growing up like that. But 
I don't know, for Jake to kind of go through the, you know, the DDP stuff and all that, uh, maybe there's, there's something he can find as a positive in terms of maybe this particular episode, his story can continue to help others because it is, boy, it's just a, it's, it's one that, um, you know, you're not going to forget once you hear the story or watch the details of the story, you're not going to forget it. Yeah, there's there's no such thing as a happy ending here. That's just not going to happen. Like, and, and some of these stories, like some of the different stories on Dark Side, do end up having something of a happy ending. There's no way that for this one too. I mean, even if the even if the kids like, reunite one day and get together, it's just you know, it's just not going to be one of those not happy ending. All you can do in a circumstance like this, I suppose, is is survive. And to their credit, they have all survived in one form or another. Yep. They have, and Jake had, uh, you know, talked to him, and you can just see the excitement for Jake, you know, to and about being sober for 10 years, and as we said, it goes back to, you know, a lot of the stuff that, that he's accomplished and, and the help of DDP and all this other stuff, but um, there's there's only so much that's uh, going to be able to help with something like this, and it's never going to completely uh, go away, but uh, I think just to see them all here, like we said at the beginning, um, that is, is something in and of itself, knowing that uh, what they went through, um, the odds were probably not in the favor of all of them actually being here to tell the story in 2021. Um, but uh, you know, for, for them, for, for the ones that, that are, um, you know, that's that's still something to think about, um, especially the ones, as we said, that have gotten into wrestling and not only had to deal with, you know, all the stuff of the, the personal nature but just to, to be in the wrestling business too. And we've seen, you know, what the wrestling business in that era has done to a lot of people. Um, and, and for them to actually be in that situation, uh, to be here to, to tell the story, it, it is something uh, to think about. But uh, I guess, Steve, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot more that to really, I mean, that was just, I thought from this episode, um, again, it's, it's one that's not easy to watch in any way, shape or form, but um, really there's, it's a lot of the stuff that, I think we had sort of known about Grizzly Smith, but when you actually hear it from the people who were directly involved and the people who were directly affected by it, um, it just, I think it takes it to another level in terms of uh, looking back and, and kind of knowing that, boy, this was just, um, th this was a mess. To, you know, to kind of sum it up and say it as simply as possible, uh, let's dark side, it doesn't get a whole lot darker than that. Yeah. There aren't a lot of darker stories out there in that one. Yeah, it was uh, a very, very dark uh, episode, and uh, we know we know what we're getting with Dark Side of the Ring, but um, that is uh, that that was the the case for this one. And before we get into the uh, the Mick Foley A and E biography, which I mean, what a what a transition! I don't think it's possible to to segue um, in terms of the the theme. Uh, but uh, the next Dark Side of the Ring uh, will be Dynamite Kid, and I think uh, that is another one that's going to be not pleasant for a, a different uh, reason, obviously not, you know, based on the, the actual theme that was in this one, but um, I think the Dynamite Kid one is also going to be one where it's like, ooh, this is a guy that certainly had his issues, uh, to say the least. It'll be interesting to see who they have telling that story, too, because obviously Dynamite Kid no longer with us. Um, Bret Hart, not, apparently not involved with the Dark Side guys anymore after that uh, particular Montreal episode. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see who they get. Yeah, I am curious uh, because that is um, again. There's a it's a story you know, but and with the hearts, there are some interesting storytellers there as well. Oh yeah, That's, who uh, uh, <laughs> they, they, they they tell stories. Uh, how how true some of the stories are, we, we don't we're not really particularly sure. Yeah, I'm curious about the. I mean, because I, I think for the most part, a lot of people like the Dynamite Kid book. Well, that will say that was released. Was that probably? Mm, early 2000s, late 90s, late early 90s. 2000s yeah. or so. I yeah. remember like reading the book, um, and I think I have. It's been a long time since I've read it, but it's like that's just one where I think back and I'm like, if I reread that now, I'm sure there would be a much different opinion just based on um, kind of you know really just diving into his story more. But I, I think that we will probably see a lot of those things. Um, you want to talk about for another. You know, pretty pretty complicated story uh, for Dynamite Kids. So I, I'm also like you. I'm curious to see who they get to to tell that one because I I don't know. There's probably some you can think about, and I'm sure they'll have the ones you know that we've seen you know that that may have had those connections. I'm sure Cornette, you know, he's been in all of these and um and all that kind of stuff. But who actually tells the story there? That's um. That's see, that's the thing is, I'm not sure that I'm not sure Cornette would have ever worked with Dynamite Kids. See, and that's what I was thinking, but I I feel like that. 
they've put so much like even for people that haven't necessarily worked i wonder if they'll just have because i, I think like the way they portray cornetta I, I feel like is almost like and they i think they put it on as um they, they use the uh on the overlay it's like wrestling historian so i feel like they're probably going to just like they're going to use cornet in that um what a and e has kind of done with um peter rosenberg and uh you know all those other guys that they i'm sure jim was you mentioned the same breath with uh peter <laughs> right. rosenberg yes yeah. <laughs> yeah, but um that is i don't know maybe cornet's not in there but i i figure that i don't know that they use cornet a lot so um, no, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be surprising. I was just making points. I'm not sure they oh, yeah. ever cross paths. No, I, I can't, I wouldn't be able to think of anything either, I guess, um, overall when they, they would have, but yeah. So, so we'll see what they do with the, uh, the dynamite kid uh, episode and, and kind of where that goes. Uh, because then I think that that's where they have the break. And then the second half yeah. of the season, uh, will come back later in the year with uh, a variety of episodes that, uh, we'll, we'll touch on. Uh, next week in that episode but uh, again no easy way to segue into the foley uh, a and e biography but this was one where i, I don't think that uh, like we've we've said before i mean this is one where you didn't really you didn't really gain anything uh new probably overall um i think a lot of this stuff has been told before and 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 that's been the theme of these a and e biographies you, you know what you're getting i mean they're coming from a wwe slant so you kind of understand uh, the story that's going to be told but Still, I mean, Foley, I think, has just always been someone where, I mean, like we said, if you want to compare and contrast, I mean, I think Foley is someone that you just you never really heard a lot of bad words about um, in terms of, um, you know, he's he's a very easy to like guy. And I think when you consider and they they really went with this theme here, when you consider what he did, you know, for the fans, even if it was just completely, you know, batshit crazy at times. Um, you know, he did, you can't say that guy didn't, didn't lay it all out there, uh, for, for entertaining the fans. And, um, I think that was, you know, they really told that and, and going through the hell in the cell stuff and, um, all the different things that, that he kind of, you know, went through throughout his career. And, um, that there was just, I think that was it. I, I can't say that there was a lot to me. It was a good, I mean, it was a, you know, a very easy two hours to watch, but I can't say there was a whole lot that really stood out from the standpoint of, oh, like that's new and, and felt like it was noteworthy uh, in that respect. The interesting thing about this, and I went into this documentary kind of thinking, you know, I've heard, I've heard all this stuff before. I was a, I was a huge McFoley, McFoley fan back in the day, you know, read all the books, watch all the DVDs, stuff like that. And I was kind of wondering now, why would they go back and do this one when we've seen all this stuff? But then I thought about it for a while, and I was like, you know what? It's been 20 years, or more than 20 years, since McFoley wrote his first book. Yeah. So I started feeling really old. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so old watching this stuff, because and then I think, you know what? There's probably a younger generation, theoretically, of wrestling fans that uh, don't know all these stories. Yeah. Because kids don't read these days. You know, we know, <laughs> we know that we write stuff. Nobody reads it. They just that's why we do a podcast, right? Like iPod, just... <laughs> that's why we do podcasts now because nobody listens. To, nobody reads anything anymore. So they haven't read McFoley books. They've heard about the guy on TV. They've seen him, you know, doing the Commissioner Foley character or uh, dressing up as Santa Claus or whatever. But they don't know the full story, which is shocking for people like you and me to think because we grew up on Hell in a Cell and the Ear Instant and all that stuff. But there's a lot of people out there that probably learned a lot from this show. Yes. And one thing kind of stuck out to me because while we're talking about books and whatnot, the, there, there still seems to be quite a bitter feeling uh, uh, from, from Rick Flair towards McFoley as, as far as I think it's kind of how Flair kind of feels that Foley took the business a certain direction that it didn't necessarily need to go in. Yeah, you got that here, I think, from from Ric Flair, and um, I mean, it wasn't personal. I think it was more of a matter yeah. of like how he, how the, where the business went. Yeah, I mean, because and he sort of said it like completely different. Um, you know, certainly when you talk about approaches to to how you to how you get over with the fans and and the things that you do, you know, for those crowd reactions and such. I mean, Flair's was a lot more. You know, it was a lot more psychological and just, you know, really got you invested from a story standpoint, whereas Foley, it was, I mean, it was like a lot of it was based on just, you know, the incredible, wild, physical feats of, you know, doing different things like that and, and doing things to your body that, um, you know, you weren't going to see in a, a Ric Flair, Ricky Steamboat match in 89 or anything like that. So, um, yeah, I think that that is something that, you know, we, we always 
because there's just so much. I mean, social media now and everything, you, you see guys and, you know, a lot of, there can be a lot of Twitter wars and, and all that with wrestlers and going back and forth. And a lot of stuff can get lost in translation sometimes. But, I mean, it does. Like, it still seems like that's one where if you really got to the heart of it and, and still to this day, you, you would probably think that they're... And you know what? You would probably think that Flair's not the only guy that felt that way, but Flair's probably the most high-profile guy that would say it. Uh, yeah, Flair that, can get away with saying these things. Exactly. Like, he can get away with saying it. You know, there's probably a lot of other guys, um, you know, of that era or even guys since then that probably look at it and think, man, um, I don't necessarily disagree at all with what Ric Flair was saying about uh, maybe with, with the direction and all those other things. But, I mean, I think for Foley, like, it... It came at a time where, you know, we saw like the business was changing. And certainly, you know, if you're going to look at the attitude era and kind of what it became, um, I mean, it it just fit in with some of the stuff that was being done. Like it was the wild over the top stuff that um, you were not going to see 10 years earlier. And, and that just, you know, we saw a lot of that here in this documentary, just re recalling all those things, whether it was Hell in a Cell, whether it was the, you know, the Royal Rumble 99 match with Rock, whether it was, you know, No Way Out 2000. Like there's just, they went up and down the line with all those different things. And then that was just kind of part of Foley's history. Yeah. And, you know, Foley, obviously not the, you know, he's just finished talking about Grizzly Smith and the horde, horror stories coming out of that family. And, Obviously, Foley, uh, completely different as far as a family man goes. There's nothing bad to be said about him there on that front. Um, all his kids uh, seem well adjusted and whatnot. And although the the thing is with Foley, you have to wonder. And he alluded to this a little bit. They didn't go quite into as much detail, but the long term consequences. Yeah. Uh, you kind of wonder going forward what what are long term consequences for Mick Foley or for other people who try to. We try to work that style, and I think we've seen some of the long-term consequences, honestly, uh, uh, for for what some of the deathmatch wrestlers have done, what they've gone through, and you know the difference between them and Foley was Foley was he had an easier time connecting with the crowd because he had that ability, uh, but then it kind of gets back to Flair's point where it's like, did Foley really need to do all that stuff? I mean, Hell in a Cell was the biggest thing in his career, no doubt, but uh, and. Maybe he doesn't get to a certain level without it, but you still wonder, was it worth it? I yeah. think that that's I, I think that's a six four thousand dollar question. And Mick Foley, uh, Mick Foley seems to think it was. I mean, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, and I think that one of the things, and we've heard this before, but like I, I felt like they really did a good job of him sort of opening up on that struggle he had with retirement and sort of questioning, you know, his legacy and all of this other stuff and. Um, you know, you're not always going to get guys that do that. I mean, you'll get guys who just, they'll always stick to their story. They'll always stick to the same sort of thought. I think that they had, you know, maybe going through, you know, their career and all this other stuff, which I'm sure we could list multiple names like that. But it's like, you did have get a sense that this is a guy who, you know, he did talk about those struggles after leaving. Um, you know, I guess that was it's probably after he had originally, you know, retired, quote unquote, and then came back and worked some of the matches. Then he went to TNA for several years, um, which I'll be honest, like, I don't even, I barely remember any of the stuff. Um, uh, TNA. Sadly, there's no reason to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, with all due respect to Foley and with all due respect to TNA, there's no reason to remember that stuff. Well, and I, I saw them, like, they put the, the years <laughs> up there. It was like 2008 to 2011. I was thinking, I don't even know what I could name anything. Uh, of his from TNA in that stretch, even though I, I watched it, I just don't remember any of it at this point. Um, and, and I think that was, that was an interesting part was for him to kind of talk about that, like how he really struggled with, with coming out of, you know, basically re retirement. Like, what do I do now? And, and that's, listen, we say that all, like, it's not even in wrestling. Like, you know, you look in sports, like any, anything else, like that's the big question mm -hmm. for anyone that leaves. And unfortunately that can lead to some very, you know, again, dark roads, like it can lead to some bad things. Once you get out of that spotlight, once you get out of that, you know, it is a grind, but it's also one that for guys like that who get used to it, uh, you come out of it and it's like, what is this? Like, what is normal life? Like, well, what is this? Like, how do I even do anything? Like, and I think for him, again, who took it to an extreme with what he did, I can understand, like, coming out of that where you're, you know, jumping off of a cell and, and you know, do, come, going through tables and flaming tables and all this other stuff. Like, 
how do you go back and sit down and watch a TV show at eight o'clock at night? Like, it's just, I mean, it's impossible to think about. And, and I just think that that is kind of the big thing with Foley that I always look back on and I'm like, I get it. Like, I completely understand why that guy had some struggles maybe uh, after, you know, getting out of wrestling. If there was anyone that's going to have that kind of struggle, it's someone like him who put his entire body and everything he had into it uh, and just did not probably at times. I mean, I'm sure there was a big struggle at times for him uh, acclimating to just what somewhat of a normal life. I mean, we're talking about a guy who, um, you know, we've talked earlier about how pro wrestling provides an escape for, for people like the, like the Smith family. And Foley eventually found his escape again after retiring. I mean, this is a guy who spends a lot of your dressed as Santa Claus. <laughs> yes, yeah, very true. We saw we saw that. <laughs> we see we see the big beard. We see him dressed up as Santa Claus and go to uh, go visit people. And you know, Foley loves Christmas. Everybody who reads his book knows and knows about that. So he's able to uh, he's able to shake the wrestling addiction. Now he's kind of fallen into uh, being Santa Claus, which is just it's another form of escape. I'm not knocking it. It's uh, it's it's a good thing for him to do. At least he's at least he's found something. Which a lot of the re- a lot of the ex wrestlers can't say they've uh, been able to replace that. Yeah, Vince. I think it was Vince's quote. Um, I don't remember what the question was they asked him, but that's kind of what was his response was. He's like, you know, any anyone like that, like what you know, what makes Mick Foley such a good person? And he's like, anyone who can you know lovingly be Santa Claus all year long. Um, you know, that's, that's the type of guy you're getting is, uh, someone who just enjoys that. And, and certainly has a, a part of him that, that wants to get back, wants to make other people smile and, and entertain other people. And I mean, you, again, you talk about two different, you know, ends of the spectrum where one part of that is falling off a cell. And another part of that is, you know, reading uh, a book to kids on Christmas like the it's just completely opposite ends um you want to talk about having some uh, versatility there there's your uh, example of that I guess for, for Foley but um yeah that's the, that's the thing is as I said earlier like I think he's just always come across as someone that when you look at everything he gave um all the things he did his body there's a, like there's another part of it like how is this guy walking now? We, we know like it's, you know, it's probably not walking the way he wants it to, not very well. I was going to say it's not well, but even the fact that he's, you know, out there playing basketball with his kid. Um, and that's what I think he had joked about, you know, it's like how many, how many feet did I get off the ground on my jump shot? And, uh, you know, you could tell like it was zero. He wasn't, he wasn't jumping uh, on a jump shot, but, uh, I think that, yeah, I mean, it's just this guy and, and everything that he put into it, uh, for him to still be, you know, standing is probably a, a miracle in and of itself uh, with all of that, so. Uh, uh, and, you know, the thing about Foley is I don't think we're going to be seeing him on the upcoming episode of Dark Side of the Ring. Yeah. Because, you know, even with the possible problems that might come physically in the in the future, uh, he seems like he's come out of everything and he's had his ups and downs, but he's Seems like one of the few guys that isn't a complete uh, complete maniac in yeah. this business. Thank God that guy is uh, still mentally sharp. Um, because as we said, there could have been so many situations that you look at and you think about. I mean, we've talked about it before, but it's like, you know, you can go back to just the, the Rumble match with Rock and all the chair shots. And like, it's just, who knows? Like, you, you know, you, you, you don't really know, I think, until that happens in terms of the long-term effects and everything. But you know there is an impact there of some sort. Uh, and yeah, that's just, uh, something you always think about, but some of the other things I thought that, that stood out, I, I put down in my notes, um, was, uh, I thought it was, it was fun to see, uh, the, the old videos, uh, which we've seen before, but like the, you know, the legend of Frank Foley and, and all this, him talking about the girl and, uh, messing his name up and everything. And then we, we saw Colonel Robert Fuller. Um, yes. he was there. I, I was thinking, I don't, I don't even remember the last time I've seen Robert Fuller in anything. Um, I thought it was kind of cool because I, you know, I'd, I'd read about some of those things, but I don't think I'd ever actually seen some of those things. So yeah. that, that was pretty cool. Yeah, I was thinking that. I was like, Robert Fuller, like, the, wow, this guy, I, you know, I, I, I told you for some random reason I was watching um, WCW Fall Brawl 95 last week. And uh, that was when Robert Fuller was uh, managing uh, Dick Slater and Bunkhouse Buck. And that was when he had his uh, his big infatuation with with Sherry. And um, I don't know. It was just I was thinking back. I'm like, wow, this guy, this guy actually looked like he's yeah, Robert Fuller. Like uh, yeah, I hadn't seen him in a while. So uh, it was it was interesting to see him in there. And uh, I really love the fact that they uh, 
you know, this was where like Foley's early promos and such, like I just, I got a kick out of, of him, you know, talking about the promo that, that he really stood out for him was uh, telling the the little stingers that he'll come up into the crowd and beat up their parents and uh, all the other stuff. Like that's just like, that's, that, that's beautiful uh, from a, a storytelling standpoint to tell the kids in the crowd, Hey, you don't, you know, ch- chime down. I'm going to come up and beat your parents up in the crowd. So um, that's not, not everybody can get away with that. So. No, you just don't see that in this day and age. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, the Miz, the Miz may do it every now and then, but uh, you don't see a lot of that. And nobody I, believes in this. I was going to say, I don't think now. he's going to do it. So uh, there, there's <laughs> a difference. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, and then, yeah, I mean, the other stuff uh, is just a lot of stuff we've seen before. You, you got, um, you know, the footage of him losing his ear and uh, the Kane Dewey promo and ECW and um, really going into the the dude love character and all those other things. And I always, th- this is something that always stands out to me. It didn't matter. Like you could put this guy in a documentary about cheese or something. And I am convinced that this guy could sell me on whatever he's saying. And that can probably be a good thing. And that can probably be a bad thing. And that's Paul Heyman. Like just telling the story of Foley joining ECW. Like it's not really a, a very theatrical story. Like it's just sort of one of your, you know, your basic, this guy comes to this company and that, but like, the way Paul Heyman told it, it's like this was the most magical thing that had ever happened in the history of professional wrestling. And uh, I think that just, once again, it shows you why this guy is so good at what he's doing now and what he's always done, really, for the most part. Um, it's just like the, the way this guy speaks. Like, I'm thinking, I don't know, like if you if you had, just imagine Paul Heyman like narrating Dark Side of the Ring and just, holy, like shit, I don't even know what you would say at that point uh, because this guy's just, the, the way he speaks is just something, so... You do understand why the ECW wrestlers did some of the crazy things they did <laughs> because they're they're backstage and Paul Heyman was telling them why it was going to be such a great idea. You know, <laughs> guy could sell you the glasses off your own face. Yeah, to be honest, that's uh, an unbelievable salesman. And uh, yes, I thought that uh, Paul Heyman kind of stood out as one of the um, you know one of the people interviewed in this uh, for that. But I mean, elsewhere, you know, the Mick Foley one I thought was again, I thought it was pretty well done. Um, a guy that's that's easy to like and and certainly has a a very you know unique story in his path to to get to where he's gotten to you know as a a star and a legend in wrestling. Um, but uh, yeah, now we now we wait, Steve, for uh, part two of the Montreal Screwjobber part part two hundred and seventy three thousand four hundred and thirty one yeah. of the the Montreal Screwjob with uh, the Bret Hart episode will be the last one on a and e uh the the eight part uh, event they've done here with with all of these ones and uh that will also be which you know we're recording this that'll be uh on sunday night and uh i mean i'm curious we said it like we we kind of laughed but you really didn't get a ton of montreal screwjob stuff in the Shawn michaels episode you would think there's probably gonna be a little bit more just because bret hart was the central figure there but I guess I'm also interested to see kind of what direction they go with this with him because we've just seen so much with you know with, with the the A and E one before like wrestling with shadows, all the stuff we've seen since then his book everything like that. Um, I don't know like I'm curious what if anything new they can bring out of something like this. I do. I feel bad for a poor guy too because he, he keeps being asked to relive the thing. Yeah, that is true. And... <laughs> Every time he goes on TV, they have to ask him about it. it's like, "Jeez, guy." I mean. The yeah. guy did other things in his career, you know. He might may ask about one or two of those things. I don't know. Yeah, it's got to be tough too, because it's not you know, it's not just that. It's you know, the Owen Hart stuff's gonna. It has to be. It's part of the story, and you know, I think for him too to. I mean, you know, you can only imagine like he relives it probably every day, but to actually have to, you know, go in depth into it um, when when he does these kind of things, um, that that cannot be an easy part of it either. But I do think and that, it'll be interesting. It'll be also be interesting if they ask. Uh, well, they probably won't. But if they if they ask Vince about that, what what's Vince? Uh, yeah. What's his take on it now? Twenty two years or so later. Yeah, my guess is they. I, I can't imagine like. Because we've seen before, like in some of these, right? Like it's very clear the the omissions they've had in some of the things where it's like we are not touching that. Um, you know, whether it's the the Booker T thing with Triple H or uh, some of the other stuff that they have, you know, omitted from the stories. I mean, the the Steve Austin part of it. Like there's th- there's lots of those different aspects uh, we've seen that that have kind of just been omitted. And I, I'm curious. You know, I can't imagine that they. They get anything from Vince that's anything substantial other than 
just probably a lot of Vince reflecting on. I mean, we, we laughed about it in the Shawn Michaels episode where Vince, had, you know, was laughing about getting punched and you know knocked out by Brett. But I, I don't know. Like, I guess there is an appealing aspect to that. Wondering is there going to be something coming out of this with Vince that um, we haven't seen before, or something that's not just uh, being you know told again for the thirtieth time. That's it. Yeah. And we've also talked before about how Vince at this point in his life, is he the, uh, is he the most reliable person to ask about, ask these yes. questions yeah, and yeah, not to dump on Vince too much because we do that all the time. It's, it's an easy thing to do. Well, it's, uh, it's also been an easy week to do that. Yeah. An easy week to do it <laughs> as well. Yeah. So yes, uh, I don't think that they're, you know, timing probably not great either from that standpoint. Uh, but this is a guy who is, you know, 75 years old and turned 76 in uh, in August. So, uh, yeah, great salesperson. I, also, like Paul Heyman, they're a great salesperson. I mean, he manages to convince all these people that he's not the reason they got fired. Yeah. He, yeah. I, the, the story is better like told. Me, but God, it's those damn writers. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's it. So, uh, well, there's, there's at least some intrigue there with the Bret Hart episode, even if a lot of it, as we said, is uh, going to be stuff that, that probably. For us, people who probably listen to this podcast, you, you've heard a lot before, but um, I think the, once again, I always think the cast of characters in these uh, can, can sort of make or break what you're going to get and your, your opinion that you're going to form coming out of it. So uh, we'll see who all is included in that. But uh, Steve, once again, another journey in the books of uh, Dark Side of the Ring, A&E biography, and uh, unfortunately, we will just have uh, the double header, uh, one more coming up uh, next week as we will uh, discuss Bret Hart and Dynamite Kid. There's some parallels when you talk about uh, careers and, and backgrounds and all that, but uh, after that, it will be uh, waiting until later in the year when Dark Side of the Ring returns for the second half of its season. But, uh, Steve, uh, I know you got a lot of stuff uh, that you have over at 41mania.com. Uh, your Ultimate Warrior, your top Ultimate Warrior matches, which we discussed last week, that'll be going up. Uh, so, people that are listening to this will, will probably already be up on the website, but that'll be up uh, late Saturday night, early Sunday morning. So, you can check that out. We kind of talked about it a little bit on the Warrior episode we did. Uh, but, uh, anything else uh, you have going on? Anything you want to plug? Uh, go for it. Well, just the usual stuff at 411mania.com, the botch column, the top seven, uh, various recaps. Um, did the AEW Dynamite there for a couple of weeks when I was when I had an opportunity to. Um, that won't be happening this week, so we'll see what happens on that front for those people. And, you know, the ROH recap and over on chairshot.com, where we take a, we'll be taking a, I'll be doing a column for there that'll be probably up by the time it gets posted, where we'll be looking at all these various comings and goings in wrestling. And my God, I just I cannot keep track of all the comings and goings in wrestling anymore. It's just it's ridiculous. There's 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 too much going on, man. There's just there's too much. There is a lot happening right now. And uh, as you said, you did do our uh, our dynamite uh, coverage on Friday night, and of course there was a a big debut. Uh, Andrade is uh, making his way to AEW, and yeah, there's just there's lots happening. Uh, but uh, we we try to have it all covered. Over at uh, 411mania.com, as always, we'll put the links uh, to all of Steve's stuff uh, in the show notes, and uh, we will continue to have the uh, GoFundMe for Larry Zonka's family in there as well, so continue to share and contribute if you can. All our other stuff, 411mania.com, all your news, uh, columns, reports, uh, reviews, everything, it's all there. Check it out. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the podcast, any podcast app you use, search for 411 on wrestling. And uh, thanks, as always, for listening to this episode of the podcast. And uh, we'll talk to you next time here on 411 on Wrestling Podcast.